we'll be going over IRS Notice CP22I. This is the tax notice that you might receive from the Internal Revenue Service if they made a change to your tax return. Uh, in this example, it's because they made a change to uh, IRS Form 5329 for IRA taxes. So um, we'll go through this step by step. This, uh, this is six pages and we'll go into a little bit more detail about this notice. Uh, but I want to point out two things first. So in the upper right hand corner, you'll see uh, the notice number, the tax year, uh, the notice date, which is probably the most important piece of information, uh, and then social security number and a contact phone number. Uh, the reason the notice date is uh, particularly important is because if there's any action item uh, that the IRS wants you to take, in this case, paying additional taxes, you only have a certain period of time uh, from the notice date to do that. Uh, so uh, when it comes to paying taxes, most of the time it's 21 days from the notice date. And we can see down here that it is uh, February 20th, 2018 happens to be 21 days after the notice date. Uh, sometimes they'll give you a specific date Otherwise, uh, they may just tell you a certain number of days from uh, the notice date. So, uh, for example, there usually is some sort of uh, mention about if you disagree, then you have maybe 60 days to notify the IRS. I'm looking for that example here, and I don't see anything right now. But I'm going to scroll back to the top, and if I catch it as we go through the rest of this notice, I'll point it out to you. Uh, so uh, keep in mind the notice date. The second thing that I would recommend is that you make sure that the IRS uh, has your current address on file. So if you've recently moved, uh, you should understand that there are three ways the IRS will update your address in your tax record. So the first way uh, normally happens when you file your next income tax return. So if you change, you know, if John and Mary Smith move to Harvard, Ohio, I don't know if there's an, a Harvard, Ohio, but if they move, then the next time that they file a tax return, uh, they'll file with their new address and the IRS will update their tax record accordingly. Uh, the second way, you can always call the IRS and update them uh, based on your tax situation. Uh, you'll go through the phone tree, you'll make, uh, you'll, uh, you'll eventually get to a representative and then you'll verify your account information and then you can update your address over the phone. And then the third way is to file the IRS change of address notice. So that's IRS form 8822. And for business owners, that's IRS Form 8822-B. We'll put links in the show notes to resources we've created about every form that we mention here. Now, let's take a closer look at uh, what this notice is telling us. So, it looks like uh, there was an account balance before this tax change, uh, outstanding taxes of almost $3,200. Uh, it looks like the IRS uh, changed IRS Form 5329 uh, for IRAs. Uh, so there's an increase in tax, there's the increase in the failure to file penalty, and then an increase in the failure to pay penalty, as well as interest. So all of that results in the total. Uh, so you can uh, go to the IRS website and make a payment. Uh, you can uh, send this voucher, which is at the bottom. Uh, I would always uh, caution people to uh, use the address, the IRS address that's on the voucher. Uh, so in this case, it's the IRS office, office in Austin. Uh, don't rely on the letterhead, which is the Georgia office. So I, I usually try to point that out to people that may be sending a check or a money order to the IRS. So if you do send a check or a money order to the IRS, you should write your social security number, uh, the tax year, and then the form number, in this case, 5329 on your tax on your tax payment. Uh, and then include this notice. That way the IRS can reconcile this against your tax record. So if you disagree, you can call the IRS uh, and review your account with a representative. 
you would want to make sure that you have your account information, your tax files, uh, backup paperwork, all of that available when you make that call. Uh, this section talks about payment options. You can use the IRS website. You can arrange for a payment plan. You can submit a request for an offer and compromise. Uh, so um, there, those are different options. Uh, if you are interested in a payment plan, you can go online. Uh, if you uh, qualify for what is known as a streamlined uh, payment plan or installment plan, uh, you may be able to do that online without any, um, there are certain thresholds where the IRS, what, they'll automatically approve it. Uh, but if your tax balance is above a certain amount, or if you're requesting a certain length of payoff, uh, then you may need to complete an installment agreement request. And that's IRS form 9465. Again, we'll put a link in the show notes to that. So uh, you can also check your tax balance by going to the, uh, this link on the IRS website. Uh, if you have uh, an IRS uh, account that you can log into. Uh, if you've already paid your balance a full, you can disregard. Uh, if you think the IRS made a mistake, you can call again, same number, uh, presumably. Uh, and then, hey, if, if, if you don't respond to the IRS, uh, which also includes if you didn't get this notice in a timely manner, the IRS considers it in the same manner because according to the IRS, you should keep your address on file and you're responsible for that correspondence. So um, you should pay that or else the penalties and interest will keep accruing. So uh, the rest of this page uh, is a summary of how they calculate the failure to file penalty, the failure to pay, uh, you can request a removal or reduction of tax penalties uh, by filing IRS Form 843. Uh, so you can uh, request an, a, a removal or a, or a reduction based on a reasonable cause. So reasonable cause would be something like a natural disaster, uh, illness or injury, a family member's death, uh, something that was out of your control that caused you to be late. The IRS will take that into consideration, and they do have a reasonable cause uh, provision that allows them to abate penalties. Uh, if this is your first time incurring a penalty, there's also a program called First Time Abate. Uh, so if you've never had a tax penalty, you can request abatement, and the First Time Abate uh, program has a wide discretion of what type of tax penalties can be abated under that. So uh, you can find more information, again, on a Form 843. Uh, the, the other reason that you could have penalties removed is if you wrote the IRS requesting advice on a specific issue, you gave the IRS uh, complete and accurate information, uh, you received a written response from the IRS, and then you use that res response on your tax return, and then the IRS comes back and imposes a penalty, you can have that abated as well. It's, I mean, it's different from relying on tax advice from your accountant if you're requesting advice from the IRS and then they turn around and penalize you because you implement that advice, then you can't have that abated. Uh, interest is a little bit more difficult. The IRS has much less flexibility on abating interest, mainly because that uh, stems directly from the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, so, however, uh, any penalties that are abated, uh, the IRS will recalculate the interest uh, so that you're only paying interest on what you rightfully owe. So, if you uh, had $45 of interest, but $15 of that was based on penalties, then when you abate the penalties, uh, the IRS would recalculate your interest and your new interest level should be about thirty dollars. That that would be kind of how that works. On the last page, uh, there are some additional resources. Uh, the one that I'm interested in is this link right here. I'm going to click on it so that we can kind of uh, see if there's anything else. And of course, there is not uh, anything here. So I'm going to see if we can find that. 
I don't see that here, so I will try one last thing. There we go. Uh, sometimes the links in, uh, uh, to a notice aren't uh, correct on the notice itself. So um, again, we're talking about uh, changes to the tax returns specifically for IRA taxes. So that would be, oh, nope. Uh, so IRS form 5329 uh, specifically discusses IRAs. Uh, and then there's a series of frequently asked questions uh, tips for next year, uh, and then links to other resources, specifically publications about IRAs. And then the last thing I'm going to do is actually pull up the IRS form uh, 5329 so we can take a look at it. So uh, basically, this is the additional taxes on qualified plans. Uh, that includes IRAs. Uh, presumably, if you receive this notice, it might be uh, either part one, part three, part four, you know, or part nine, if you're required to take minimum distributions from an account and you did not do that. So uh, that's the tax form that the IRS is talking about in this particular notice. So um, I'll go back to this, but I think we kind of um, have finished uh, talking about this notice and I think I've covered all of the salient points about IRS notice CP22I. So again, you would receive this if there's a correction on your form 5329. Uh, so that's all we have for this video. I'll put links in the show notes to the articles and the videos that we've created about the forms mentioned here. So if you like our articles, uh, please subscribe to our newsletter. If you like our YouTube videos, please subscribe to our channel. And if there's anything, uh, any questions or uh, comments, or if there's a topic that you'd like to see discussed in an, up, in an upcoming video, please hit me up in the comment section. Thank you very much and have a great day.